Hello and welcome to the Smart Recovery Podcast, your audio headquarters for inspiring and insightful discussions on the topic of addiction recovery. What you'll hear with us will be self-empowering, science-based, and stigma-free. We believe you have the power within yourself to make changes that will move you toward a more satisfying life. And we hope these messages and interviews with leading addiction experts and advocates will help you believe that too. Remember that the purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. It is not a substitute for medical care from a doctor or other qualified medical professionals. Before making any changes in your treatment plan, please discuss your thoughts with your medical provider. Today on the Smart Recovery Podcast, we'll be listening to a presentation given at the 2019 Smart Recovery National Conference by Dr. Richard Sates, titled, Words Matter. Addiction Terminology, Accuracy, and Stigma. Dr. Sates is Chair and Professor of Community Health Sciences at Boston University School of Public Health, and also a professor in the School of Medicine. He is an Associate Editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Addiction Medicine, and author of over 200 peer-reviewed publications. In this talk, Dr. Sates discusses substance use disorders as health conditions, how language promotes stigma and affects policy and care, and the emergence of accurate non-stigmatizing terminology. And now, Dr. Richard Sates. Thanks to Joe Gerstein, who uh, invited me to this meeting. And Oh, there you are, Joe. Um, and has been kind enough to help me train uh, public health students and medical students, uh, as well as uh, resident physicians and others in the hospital in recent years. And since he came to me, and, and since a number of you came to me, I decided it was time to accept an invitation and, and come to you all. Um, I also just realized, sitting in the audience, uh, watching that film, uh, that uh, there's a great link from that film to this talk. Uh, a number of the words uh, that came up, uh, in particular, I think the, first, the very first word in the video, I think, just about, at least the one that was on the screen, was about choice. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So. I am uh, very much into words, and, and the reason that I uh, selected some of those things for Caton to say about my bio was not so much to let you know something about academic gravitas or experience, it was much more to say that I'm very much interested in terms and words and terminology and their meaning, um, and I spend a lot of my time editing and editing uh, uh, material that's around, uh, around addiction. So, so uh, that's why I let him say those things, and uh, we'll talk about uh, this topic, that words matter, addiction terminology. And I like to think of it, you know, a lot of the time I uh, talk to folks about using the right words to minimize stigma or avoid stigma or help eliminate stigma. Uh, but that doesn't always get the best reception. When I talk about accuracy, though, people, a wider swath of people are more receptive when I uh, begin discussing terms and making sure that we're using accurate terms. So let's see how that goes with the first slide. Uh, we can skip this because Caton just mentioned some of these activities that I do. I'm going to tell you that alcohol and drug use are like other health risks that substance use disorders are health conditions. There's a spectrum, though, from use to use with consequences. And those distinctions really matter. We talk about and we address alcohol and drugs differently from other health risks and conditions. And those two things are related, how we talk about them and how we address them in society and, and, and even in clinical settings. And language contributes to and reflects stigma, and it affects policy and care. That's, uh, that's why I think language is so, so critical. And there's consensus that's emerging around accurate, non-stigmatizing terminology. I'm going to repeat this slide at the end of the talk, and hopefully the things that I say in between will support all of that. So we can go to the next slide. So on the top left here, you have a guy at Five Guys who's eating or about to eat a huge cheeseburger. And then in the middle, a, slide that, uh, a graph that you can't see looks at um, rising curves. That's all you need to see. It's rising curves uh, that if you eat more red meat, um, the curve goes up uh, for heart disease, stroke, and uh, overall mortality. And then on the right-hand side, you see a photo of a, uh, 
of a couch potato, um, someone who has a risk, a risk factor for a health condition, which is um, uh, minimal or little physical exercise. You can click again. Uh, and on the bottom now, what you see is the kinds of things that we do. That's how we address health risks. So maybe someone will counsel him to get a little bit more uh, physical activity into his week. Maybe somebody will give the gentleman in the top left some medication to help ameliorate that risk. Uh, but, uh, th this is a cholesterol-lowering medication. Maybe somebody will do some dietary counseling, some nutrition counseling, um, or, or maybe some other um, medications. Next slide. Uh, this is the institution where I trained as a physician, uh, and I started my training in the 1980s there, uh, and saw many patients with alcohol and other drug disorders. And uh, the bottom is before I was there. I was not there in the 1890s. Um, the top left is what the clinic building looks like now. Uh, and if you click again, um, on the right-hand side are the kinds of things we do in healthcare settings. So if you have, let's say, chest pain or even high cholesterol, you might go into a clinical setting like ours, and we might do a fancy procedure, some technology, that's a cardiac catheterization on the top right. Then there's a picture of somebody getting counseled for, uh, regarding their health behaviors, taking medications and maybe doing some physical activity and changing diet. There might be some medications and, and you see, and, and maybe even surgery for a condition like, like heart disease or some other invasive procedure. Next. Um, here's instead, though, what it looks like when we, uh, when we do something about substance use, right? Um, we have uh, a president in the 1970s who created the DEA and declared a war on drugs. We had an era of just saying no, next. Uh, just keeping calm and saying no, next. And let's compare back again. So now I'm going back and forth from usual health risks to the special situation of, of substance use. Um, usual health conditions and substance use related conditions. So what happens to people with diabetes when they go to jail, when they're incarcerated? We continue their insulin. They continue to receive it. What happens to pregnant women with diabetes? Pregnant women with diabetes receive prenatal care and postnatal care. What happens to pregnant women who drink and smoke cigarettes? They and their babies receive pre and postnatal care might be different from drugs. Next slide. For drugs, if you are, let's say, um, using opioids and are physically dependent or you're taking methadone and you are incarcerated in most places in the United States, that will not be continued um, and you'll withdraw from opioids. And then when you uh, leave prison or jail, uh, you'll be at high risk for an overdose death um, and you'll very likely relapse to using that because it, for many reasons that you probably know. Um, uh, in fact, a study that Jody Rich done, did, uh, he's at Brown University, was a trial comparing continuing methadone during incarceration to not, and not unsurprisingly, he found that people who continued methadone did much better than those who didn't when they were incarcerated. Uh, but the more interesting fact is that on the right-hand side here, I've put a piece of an editorial that was written in the Lancet Worldwide Medical Journal that um, is called uh, Withdrawal from Methadone in U.S. Prisons, Cruel and Unusual. So they, almost, they actually thought that Jody's study was unethical to even test that. But what he was testing was standard of care or standard practice, rather, in the United States. Um, on the bottom left, uh, there's a lot, uh, I've just cited one, um, one example, Alabama's law, a chemical endangering law that prosecutes and punishes women who give birth to babies who have drugs detectable um, in their systems. Rather than uh, providing health care, um, they're prosecuted. Next slide. Uh, and so there is this stigma, and I think it's related to words, and I am going to get to words pretty soon. Uh, there is this stigma, and it's, it's maintained in part by words, uh, but Bill White, who I see is also on your board, uh, wrote a piece that was uh, uh, really uh, quite challenging and made me think a lot. He asked the question, who profits from maintaining stigma and who profits from continuing to Complex. use the child welfare system, 
the alcohol, tobacco, and, and even pharmaceutical industries, and even specialty sector addiction treatment. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I don't mean uh, uh, to, to lob a, a damning blow at the entire addiction specialty treatment system, but I think he made a few good points in this. You can look at that in his blog, and I'll refer back to this a little bit. Next slide. Uh, now, I mentioned that I was going to link your video to, uh, to this talk, which it does very well by using the word choice. And these three, uh, actually these four books that came out in the, within the, all within the last five years um, address this. Uh, the, the idea that addiction may be a choice. Now I know that's not what was being referred to in the, um, uh, in the, in the video that we saw. Uh, but the word choice plays prominently here. Addiction as a disorder of choice. And there actually is a fair amount of scientific evidence that choice is involved, certainly in substance use, and then maybe even in continued addiction, although I'll make the case and I'll give you the punchline right now that of course it's not entirely due to simple choice, although disorder of choice and learning may certainly be involved. So let's look at the next slide. I think you're all familiar with uh, Bruce Alexander's rat experiments, uh, so-called rat park. And uh, what he observed at first, and actually what many scientists, and I'll do this very briefly for, in case many of you are familiar with Alexander, really to recognize one more fact about that. It's not, it wasn't just giving rats drugs that led them to use them until they died. It was, he also noticed that this on the right hand side is where rats live. Well, not rats in real life, but rats in, in laboratories. They live in a so-called Skinner box they live alone in that box, and every now and then a psychology student or intern comes in and does an experiment that gives them foot shocks, which is very unpleasant. So next slide. So what he designed is Rat Park, this lovely park for rats that has ex an exercise wheel and lets them hang out with other rats and be social and enjoy their lives outside of such a box. Next slide. And when he did that, he then compared when he gave them free, um, uh, free opioids, morphine. And uh, so they got free morphine, free access to morphine, and the top lines that are solid, these white lines that are uh, above, compared to the dashed lines below, the top lines are the rats that are living in the unpleasant, lonely, foot shock Skinner boxes, and the bottom lines that actually decline over time in terms of their morphine use are the ones that are living in Rat Park. So it wasn't just the drug. It was something about the rest of their lives. Next slide. And then this was reflected in really a landmark paper. And I have to say, some of the most important papers in science and, and, and medicine are the most obvious and the simplest designs. Um, nothing too complicated. You don't need complicated statistics. Um, Lee Robbins published this in the mid-1970s. <laughs> and terrible circumstances, I might point out, in Vietnam. Ten, eight to ten months later, of those folks who were using drugs in Vietnam, mostly injecting, fewer than 10% still met criteria for a current opioid use or heroin use or substance drug use disorder. And two-thirds of them were not using opioids at all. They compared that, not directly, but they had another sample of people who were people who were in the U.S., who uh, did not go to Vietnam and suffered from addiction and ended up uh, in hospital treatment for addiction. In fact, they got six months of the best kind of hospital treatment that was available for addiction at the time. And six months after that hospital treatment, 70% of them still met criteria for a current disorder and only 10% were not using drugs, 90% were. So this says nothing actually about treatment, right? This says something about circumstances are involved in whether uh, the symptoms of addiction continue. Next slide. And in, a national, uh, in national survey data, and th this is from the mid-2000s, but this has been repeated uh, more recently, if you look at people who met criteria for alcohol dependence, using the slightly older terminology, um, if, you, if you looked at folks who had that last year, and then checked this year to see how many people have it, only 25% still do 
Now that's in the general population. So if you survey people in the general population, you find people with alcohol use disorder, then you look a year later, only 25% of them still meet criteria. That tells me something, um, that there's something that isn't permanent, just like in the video that you saw. It's not incurable, and sometimes it goes away. Now, for all, uh, what we, for all we know, we don't know what these folks got, but I'm, I can assure you that all of them did not get treatment. Um, uh, some of them may have been to SMART, some of them may have been elsewhere. Um, most of them, though, got probably nothing. Next slide. Now, this, this isn't we're not talking about a simple habit, though. We know that, right? We're not talking about simple choice. We're not talking about a simple habit like tying your shoes on the left-hand side. We are talking about something that does affect the brain, and it affects it differently from some other pleasurable experiences that we have. So what you see um, on the right-hand side here is that if you have a nice meal, perhaps the kind that you just had this evening, in the brain, pleasure chemicals, dopamine and the pleasure pathway of the brain goes up. And while you can't see the numbers here, the numbers are not important, you can see that it goes up a little bit. And you can measure that, and you can measure it in those poor rats in those Skinner boxes. But it happens in people too. Sex causes the same sort of thing. Uh-oh, now we've got a problem. Houston? Um, I can do this without slides. Um, so uh, sex causes the same rise in the pleasure pathway chemicals, but a little bit more than food. But what drugs that end up uh, leading to, or psychoactive drugs, or drugs that end up leading to or being associated with addiction do, is they increase those chemicals by 10 times more. That in the, in the middle there, especially if you look at amphetamine, thank you, on the le top left slide there, um, it's much more than, than the normal physiologic response. So something's, something is going on that's biological. I'm not necessarily saying that that, I, I would never say that's the only cause of addiction, but it's certainly part of the story. Next slide, please. So back to choice. First of all, I'm going to make the case that substance use and substance use with consequences or disorder is not all one thing that not all use is a disease, and maybe you'll make the case to me later that none of this is a disease. Um, no one would choose addiction, though. So something's happening that's, that's out of control, out of our control, even if first use is a choice. And repeated use does have some brain effects. So there are some brain effects when you use a drug the first time and, and repeat it, and then there's some use, uh, repeated um, uh, effects that happen over time that may make it hard to stop. So there are some biological things happening. But some of the things I showed you weren't <laughs> biological at all, right? Being in Vietnam is not a biological thing. Being in Rat Park is not biological. That's sociological and environment. And there's also genetic, a genetic role. The other thing about choice is, even if you want to say, even if some would like to argue, this is a choice. People are choosing to use substances. And it's as simple as that. We treat the consequences of all sorts of other choices. If you choose to get on a motorcycle and you end up having a severe injury, we treat those injuries. We don't say, no, we're not going to treat it because you made a bad choice. Next slide. So not one thing. The spectrum from use all the way to disorder is, is not one thing. There's more to the story. Next, next slide. So when I, I've been using the word substance use disorder, and that's consistent with the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and uh, the, the, the uh, 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 sorry, fifth edition from 2013. And they list these 11 criteria. And if you have two or more of these over the past year recurrently, not explained by something else, um, and causing distress, that, meets, that means that you meet criteria for a substance use disorder. Uh, most folks who end up needing and receiving some sort of formal treatment or end up um, in Smart Recovery or Alcoholics Anonymous or someplace like that have four or five uh, or more criteria, probably not just two or three. Now this is, the dis this is disorder um, and it's the label for a health condition. Next slide. But there's more. And I want to spend a, a few moments on this, and I'll read all the words on here because I realize that at the back you're not going to be able to see some of these small words. Here's a triangle here, and at the tip of the triangle, 
the least common but most severe health concern is substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder or drug use disorder. That used to be divided into abuse and dependence before 2013. Now it's all one thing, alcohol use disorder. But below that, the larger part of the triangle that's still orange, so you could just focus on the color, the larger part of that triangle is actually composed of people who are using substances, maybe too much, but don't have a disorder. They don't meet those criteria that I showed you. But they are at risk for something. They're either at risk for going on to that disorder or they're at risk for consequences just from their use. So if somebody has six drinks and then trips and falls and injure themselves, they may not have a substance use disorder or an alcohol use disorder, but they've got risky use. And now they have risky use with one consequence. Now that triangle, that whole triangle from risky use without even having a consequence all the way through to substance use disorder, which could range from mild to moderate to severe, is unhealthy alcohol use or unhealthy drug use. Any other use, and you might argue that, there, that there's no safe or healthy alcohol or drug use, and you may well be right about that, um, but there's argument about that. It's at the very least, there's some lower risk use and then no use. But the, what we're concerned about from a health perspective is that whole triangle of unhealthy use, which isn't just disorder. Next slide. So I'm gonna, now for those of you who are more word oriented rather than picture, this slide says the same thing. So we've got a health condition, use disorder, or addiction. The American Society of Addiction Medicine would call that addiction. Uh, and then internationally, they use some, old ter some, some other terms. So for those who are clinicians, you may be using international coding schemes that still use the word dependence. But I'm going to stick with substance use disorder today as the health condition. And then on the right-hand side, there's either hazardous use or risky use, using something that risks eventual consequences. Now, I do have disease up there. And some might not be happy with that. I saw it in the um, video. She didn't actually say, she, 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 uh, the person in the video, the voiceover said um, that you don't have something incurable. She didn't say it wasn't a disease, but actually I don't want to argue. I really don't want to, unless you guys do, we could, we could have that argument um, about uh, whether it's a disease or not a disease. I think it's fairly clear that it's a health condition. It's got health risks and consequences, no question about it. And truth be told, it meets the WHO, World Health Organization, definition of a disease, but we don't have to necessarily go with that. And like I said, I, I don't think it's worth focusing on whether it is or isn't a disease. There's no question that there's health risks and consequences. Um, the arguments are really about choice and responsibility. You know, if I say it's a disease, you might think, well, then that means it can't be, choice can't be involved, but it's also not my responsibility and it's incurable. So I, I don't want to draw those conclusions. I don't want to have disease have those implications. And by the way, I don't think disease has to have those implications. That's where the argument is. Okay, next slide. So, now, stigmatizing terms, so some, you may be feeling that some stigmatizing terms may have been out there or coming, maybe not. They can affect how patients behave, how their loved ones behave, how people behave, how their general public behaves and acts, and how scientists study, and how clinicians treat people, and it can affect the quality of care and health policies. Next slide. So, uh, and, oh, and just, uh, this is just a slight aside. The old term dependence, you might still hear, I try to not use that because it's confusing. Dependence could mean simply physical dependence on a substance, like if I take a beta blocker medication for my high blood pressure, I will be physically dependent on it. So suddenly now I have beta blocker dependence. I don't think that's the health condition we're talking about when we talk about addiction. If I take opioids for pain every day as prescribed, I will become physically dependent um, and withdraw if I stop them suddenly. That's not the condition that we're talking about. So it's good that it was changed in DSM-4 and that we no longer use that as the term for substance use disorder. Next slide. When I uh, was uh, preparing a version of this talk a few years ago, this popped up on my screen from the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, and they write, wrote a really pretty good story about a neonatal intensive care unit medical director 
uh, it, but the title said that that director was tending to opioid addicted infants. This put me over the edge and I called them and I talked to people and I said, you have to change that because there's something wrong with that title. What's wrong with that title? Babies cannot be addicted because babies cannot have continued use despite knowledge of harm. They can't do that. So I called them and they were very receptive. Next slide. And they changed it to a more medically accurate headline. So they actually took the other one down, replaced it with neonat neo neonatal abstinence syndrome. Some of you might prefer neonatal opioid withdrawal, which might be even more accurate um, if, if that's what they were talking about. Next slide. Now, stigma is moderated by two factors that I hinted at already. Did the per does the person who has a substance use disorder, did they cause all their problems? Uh, or is it not their fault? So if it's not their fault, then they would be less stigmatized and we might have more compassion. Can they help it? Even if they did contribute to it, can they help it? If they can't help it, that also decreases stigma and increases compassion. So, so um, the, the words that we use might reflect on what we think about these characteristics. Next slide. Um, referring to someone as a substance abuser implies sort of this willful misconduct, that it's their fault and that they could help it. Having a substance use disorder implies some condition, some health condition, condition and that it's not their fault and that they cannot help it. Now, they probably can help it, right? There's lots of health conditions that you can help. Being a health condition doesn't mean that you can't help it. Um, but does it really matter? Does it really matter whether we refer to people with addiction or substance use disorder as a substance abuser or someone who has a substance use disorder and the implications that comes with? Next slide. It turns out, yeah. So John Kelly, who you'll see tomorrow, looks like in one of the morning talks, a colleague uh, from across town where I am in Boston, um, spoke uh, at the White House a few years ago to present one of the few studies on this issue. Next slide. And what he did was he took doctoral level clinicians and he randomly assigned them to read one of these two paragraphs, which I'm not going to give you time to read the whole paragraph except to note the bold words. So in the top paragraph, he described Mr. Williams as a substance abuser. And in the bottom paragraph, he described Mr. Williams as having a substance use disorder. Next, paragraph, uh, next slide. Um, and it turns out that how we talk and write about these conditions and individuals suffering from them really does matter. So counselors, those doctoral level clinicians who were in the condition, that is they were assigned to read the first one, where it called Mr. Williams a substance abuser, they agreed more often with the notion that Mr. Williams was personally cul culpable, was seen as a social threat, and they were less likely to recommend treatment and they thought punitive measures should be taken. Now these are doctoral level clinicians who's, who are, who've devoted their lives to taking care of people with mental health and substance use conditions and simply reading two different vignettes with two different words made a difference in, in, in how they responded to this, of course, anecdotal or, or theoretical uh, patient, made up patient. Next slide. Um, more words. So uh, methadone, a treatment a treatment for opioid use disorder remains controversial. This quote, I don't believe in methadone. Uh, it's just substituting one drug for another, liquid handcuffs. Um, I, when people tell me they don't believe in methadone, I just tell them it, methadone is not a religion. You don't have to believe in it. Um, it either just works or it doesn't. But these are examples of words from, that I just got from local Boston area um, news sources. Addicts shoot up in Mass General Hospital bathrooms. Addicts shoot up. Um, I think we could do better than those terms. I'll tell you how in a second. And my least favorite, really truly most upsetting um, that I've come across in the sort of main, this is kind of mainstream media. It's the other newspaper in Boston called the Boston Herald. And uh, this was now 15 years ago when uh, we spent uh, $16 billion of your money in Massachusetts to build a big highway. And the people who were building that highway were construction workers and some of them had a medical condition. And they went um, to 
obtain methadone at a methadone clinic, which they could only do at 6 in the morning before they were going to work, and they had to line up because that's the only way you could do it. And they took, uh, the Boston Herald took a picture of them uh, and called them big dig junkies. Uh, and said, they say here, truckers punched in, punch in at a drug clinic uh, before work. Now these are folks who have a health condition and are receiving treatment for that health condition. And this is what we did in the mainstream press about that. Next slide. Uh, now, even the direct, you can't, actually it's probably pretty good that you can't see the authors on the New England Journal article that I have on the top left there, but I'll tell you, it's Nora Volkoff who's the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and she used the word abuse in the title of an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, which tells you that it's really hard to change this stuff. Uh, but there is some change, um, and uh, a writer in the Boston Globe uh, wrote an article about how there is move, a move afoot to change the language around addiction. Next slide. Uh, and I got into a little bit of a Twitter tussle uh, with this author um, who said, well, you know, I, I, I get that, um, I get that, uh, you know, we should probably call it, per, call the person person with a substance use disorder, but I'm a journalist, she says to me, and we need, like, fewer words. And, um, and I said to her, uh, how is it that we are able to write any news articles about people with cancer? So you're thinking, right? You're thinking about that. Is there a word like equivalent to substance abuser for a person with cancer? There isn't. And somehow journalists are able to write articles like that. Um, and she answered down here on the right, good point. I love that. I love when that happens. <laughs> Next slide. Um, this is really substance abuse. If you've got a substance, <laughs> in, next, next slide. So, so the International Society of Addiction Journal Editors, which, uh, which I'm currently president of, um, before I was president, produced this statement. And it was the one thing that the editors internationally could agree on, because it's really hard to agree to terminology across multiple languages and cultures. But the one that they agreed on uh, was not using the term abuse, in at least in clinical publications or publica scientific publications, because um, that's, that's their ken, about <clears throat> Uh, about addiction, and uh, uh, they all agreed that, um, that, that that simply shouldn't be used. Now part of that is definition, like we don't know what the definition is anymore. It's not accurate, so, so why use a term that might be stigmatizing, especially if it isn't accurate? Next slide. Um, and then we wrote this paper, which is more related to treatment, uh, which we called Stop Talking Dirty, and that's to recommend that folks um, avoid using the terms dirty or even clean, not, clean isn't actually better than dirty, because clean implies that you could have been dirty, or abuser. And instead, do what we do for other um, health conditions if you have a test. You have a negative test or a positive test if you're going to get, let's say, urine testing. Next slide. Um, there's a few other terms that sometimes bother me, like medication assisted. I'm wondering what it's assisting. Um, now, that d the fact that I don't like to include assisted does not by any means suggest that I don't think that um, counseling and mutual help and self-help and other um, treatments are not valuable. They are valuable. But we don't do that for other conditions where counseling is valuable. If you have diabetes, nutritional counseling and behavioral counseling is actually critical to both medication adherence and changing diet um, and physical activity, but we don't call it medication-assisted treatment of diabetes or cancer or high blood pressure or asthma. Instead, we just call it medication or we just call it treatment. Um, it's also not substitution. Opioid agonist treatment is not substitution uh, because it doesn't substitute very well. If you use methadone every day or buprenorphine every day, um, you're not having the same effect as injecting heroin. It's just not the same. Um, so call it treatment, opioid agonist treatment. There's now been a lot written about that. The, the worry, and Sarah Wakeman wrote a piece about this, her worry about using medication assisted was really not about political correctness or sensitivity to whether you think that counseling or medication is more important or all that. It was just that what it did is it gave a lot of places an excuse to not cover medication and to not offer it. And that's not right. Next, next slide. So um, at the journal, one of the, the journal that I edit, Journal of Addiction Medicine, uh, we do have some guidance then to use person-first language. So not addict, not alcoholic, um, 
and not drunk, but a person with, and then describe what, what it is that's going on. Avoid abuse and abuser, and usually use is more accurate. Usually when I get a paper at my journal and people have used the term abuse, they'll say something like 10% um, uh, were abusing cocaine. And I go back to them and I say, were they using it or abusing it? And, and by the way, please educate me as to what the difference is, right? I, I don't know what they, what they mean. So really what they usually mean is just use. That's what they mean. If you want to have a value judgment about it or talk about the consequences, that's fine. But what they measured is, did you use it or not? Um, and then for the disease, substance use disorder, I think I've made that case, addiction, a reasonable alternative term, um, and then some of the other international terms. And then um, I tend to avoid the word misuse because it's often misunderstood, although the place that it has its greatest use is uh, for prescription medications. Because prescription medications have a prescribed use. Uh, there's a way to use them that's well codified and directed, as directed. Um, misuse would be not doing that. It would be using that medication in some other way other than it's directed, perhaps without a prescription or more than is prescribed. And that, that's when I would use the term misuse. Otherwise, I wouldn't use it because it's hard, um, it's hard to know what people really mean. Um, next, uh, oh, uh, sorry, one more. Yeah, instead for anything that isn't use disorder, I might use terms like risk or risky, at risk, hazardous, or if I want to talk about the whole spectrum from use that risks consequences all the way to disorder, I'll go back to that orange triangle and call it unhealthy use if I want to use one word. I came up, I'll tell you, you know, I came up with that term um, in, in 2005 really because I needed, I, I really, uh, it, it was for, um, help in getting my work done. I was writing articles and writing grant applications and the like, and I kept having to write things like use that risk consequences and use that was associated with the consequence and substance use disorder, including abuse and dependence. And that took up my whole paper or application. I needed one word for all of that, and that's why I ended up coming up with that piece. Okay, next slide. But wait a second. Wait a second. Um, Am I saying that you can't, if you want, am I saying that you can't call yourself an alcoholic if, if that suits you? And Next slide. Well, people with substance use disorder, alcohol and other drug use disorders, were recently surveyed. This is from uh, uh, the journal called Addiction, published just this year. More than 70% of people use the term addict um, to describe themselves when speaking to others. Um, it was most common at 12-step programs. Fewer than 15% reported using the word user to describe themselves. Um, and the most preferred label that when, when, when they told the researchers what they wanted other people to call them, so they themselves might refer to themselves as addict, but they wanted other people to call them a person who uses drugs and they didn't want to be called misusers or dependent. Next slide. Um, so, actually go back one, I'm sorry. Yeah, so people can call themselves, I'm not here to tell people what to call themselves. I am here to talk to journalists and to people writing for the public. I'm here to talk to the media. I'm here to talk to clinicians. I'm here to talk to folks about when you're referring to other people and when you're um, writing something clinical, something related to health, then we should use terms that are accurate. And uh, if you use terms that are accurate by, uh, as a side effect, they'll also likely be less stigmatizing. But if somebody wants to call themselves an alcoholic, and frankly, um, some people do better when they call themselves an alcoholic, right? They say, hi, I'm rich, I'm an alcoholic, and then um, uh, that reminds me that I need to do some things today um, to continue to have a good life and not drink alcohol. So for some people, that's quite helpful. I do think that 30 years from now, maybe, 40 years from now, maybe, um, there will be less of that. Um, and I think that'll be good because although I think calling oneself an, alcohol, an, addict, uh, an alcoholic or an addict is just fine, 
I do think there's a little bit of self-internalized stigma that comes along with that. And I would like for that to not have to be the case. And so if, if, if 20, 30, 40 years from now, we see people saying, no, you know, I suffer from a substance use disorder, I think we'll be a little bit better off. Next slide. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, having a health condition or a disease doesn't remove responsibility. Plenty of people have diabetes and have the responsibility of taking care of it. But it also doesn't mean that somebody's behavior cannot be objectionable. I'll show you what I mean. Next slide. Uh, th that our, uh, uh, the disorder that we're interested in, substance use disorder, does sometimes come with violence, crime, and externally harmful behavior. But it's, by not, it's not even close to the majority of folks with substance use disorder. It's the small minority of people with substance use disorder um, who, have, uh, who, who exhibit these behaviors. And, um, but we do have to recognize um, that, it, that, um, that it sometimes does come along with that and may be different from other health conditions in that regard. Next slide. Now, it's difficult to change language in society. It's really difficult because of inertia. Uh, people get used to using words. Brevity, like I told you about the journalist that I had a little Twitter um, squabble with. And then there's the agencies. We've got agencies in the United States like the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, single state agency names. Although I'll tell you that in Massachusetts, the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services changed to the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services. It took legislation in Massachusetts. Um, a, someone took a lot of time and advocacy to go in and change the words in all of the laws and actually get it passed um, to change the word abuse to addiction and to not change the acronym from BSAS. It stayed, Bureau of Substance Addiction Services. There's a journal called Substance Abuse, and it's very hard to change the name of a journal. There are society names um, that, have, um, that, have, that have, name, have words in them that we'd like to change. Uh, but none of that would really be an excuse if we, were, if we were arguing to, if we were making the case that we needed more accurate terms for something like heart disease or cancer. This, I, I show you a, a response here to a letter that I wrote to a, to a very prominent journal, one of the highest impact factor journals in the world, a scientific or medical journal, um, uh, JAMA Internal Medicine, uh, or Archives of Internal Medicine, as that was previously called. And they had written a paper about screening for, um, for something, <laughs> for substance use. And that paper didn't distinguish between whether the, whether the test was for substance use like risky use or for disorder. And so a colleague and I wrote a letter to the editor and we said, you know, it was a nice paper, but it's really hard to use that in practice because your little test doesn't distinguish between risky use and disorder. The esteemed editor of this journal wrote this back to us. He said, that McNeely and Sates are correct that the field of drug use and screening would benefit from clarity in terminology. Thank you. <laughs> however, however, this is a medical leader. However, in practice, it can be very challenging to distinguish between substance use and a substance use disorder. This, I was, I, I remain absolutely shocked by this. Um, this, this is like saying you can't tell, an, a, a doctor can't tell the difference between chest pain and a heart attack. I mean, it, it, it's, it, if you think about it, it's really shocking. This is, and this is the level. So, so this is going to hold terminology a little bit back. Next slide. But things are moving some. Uh, and in that same year, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, so a related journal, Michael Botticelli, who is the head of the Office of National Drug Control Policy at the White House under President Obama, wrote a piece uh, in October of 2016 uh, on changing the language of addiction and, uh, and made a lot of the points that I'm making today. Next slide. And some hospitals like our own and other hospitals are, um, are, are actually making a push 
uh, to use uh, more accurate terminology. And we even influenced the Associated Press or AP Stylebook, which is the Bible for journalists that they refer to. And they, they don't, I mean, they admittedly don't always follow it, but it, it's a, it is a reference and it is a serious reference. Um, in the 2017 edition, um, they made the case to not use the word abuse. Uh, and, and also to use person first language, people with a substance use disorder or people with addiction rather than substance abuser. So there is progress being made. Next slide. And Michael uh, Botticelli uh, wrote this memo from the executive office of the president. You, the, the, date, the date is important here. It's January 9th, 2017. Um, and he wrote that memo, and this, you, can, you can actually still find this memo online, and I don't believe that it's been you know, formally rescinded. It's sort of in the depths of, 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 um, of government websites, but, but it actually directed all departments of the United States government um, to use accurate terminology to refer to people with addiction. Next slide. I promised I'd show this to you, and I hope we achieved this, that alcohol and drug use have health risks, Substance use, uh, um, substance use disorders are health conditions. There's a spectrum of use and consequences, and the distinctions matter. We talk, how we talk about and address alcohol and drugs is different from what we do for other health risks and conditions, and those two things are related, how we talk about it and how we address it in policy and practice. And language contributes to and reflects stigma and it affects policy and care. And there is some consensus emerging around accurate non-stigmatizing terminology. Next slide. So there are some words here and, and I know that um, this will be, this is being uh, recorded and, and maybe slides, I'm happy to make slides available um, via your organization, SMART. Um, and, and I've listed here terms that people tend to think are less stigmatizing or non-stigmatizing language on the left and stigmatizing language on the right. I don't want to be the thought police or the political correctness police. I'm really more about accuracy with, with less stigma and with better policies and practice as a side effect. Um, Thanks for listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. If you found today's episode helpful and inspiring, we encourage you to share it with someone who might need to hear its messages. If you or someone you know needs addiction-related help, we encourage you to visit smartrecovery.org to find a wealth of digital resources, practical tools, and social supports meant to help you and your loved ones on their recovery journey. While there, you can search for a local SMART meeting near you or join our online community to find 24-7 access to recovery help through regular online meetings and helpful message boards and forums. All of our meetings and online community resources are completely free of charge. Be sure to connect with us online to get more helpful addiction-related resources. Visit our website at smartrecovery.org, where you can search for local meetings, join our online community, subscribe to our e-newsletter, and find regular blogs, videos, podcasts, and more. You can also help us to spread our self-empowering, science-based messages to more people who need to hear from them in important ways. First, get trained on the Smart Recovery Program. If you are a licensed healthcare provider and could benefit from using Smart Recovery in your professional work, or if you are someone who would like to volunteer and lead Smart Recovery meetings in your community, please check out our training and volunteer opportunities at www.smartrecovery.org training. Second, donate to support our work. Smart Recovery is a nonprofit that runs on the donations from generous supporters who understand the need for recovery-related support. If you would like to help us reach more people, consider donating to Smart Recovery at smartrecovery.org slash donate. We'd like to thank U.S. World Meds for their generous support of this episode. We'll see you next time on the next episode of the Smart Recovery Podcast.